Thermal envelope is the skin of a building that separates the conditioned areas from outdoor or from a non-conditioned area. In this example, the exterior walls, windows, doors, roofs, slabs, foundation walls are all part of the thermal envelope. The components that have conditioned spaces on both sides, such as interior partitions and floors, or have unconditioned spaces on both sides, such as the sloped roof above an uninsulated attic, are not part of the thermal envelope. In the thermal envelope, there are opaque and transparent elements. Sensible and latent heat flows through both types of elements. However, the transparent components have an additional heat transfer path, radiation. In the thermal envelope, some elements have air on both sides, which is air-to-air -air condition. Other parts of the envelope have an air-to-earth heat flow. The methods of estimating heat transfer through these two types are different. Heat moves through an envelope in three ways, conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is the movement of heat energy directly through solid materials. Radiation is the movement of heat through space as electromagnetic waves, such as solar radiation and thermal radiation. Convection is the flow of heat within a fluid, such as air. Infiltration is the convection of outside air into a building through breaches. Conduction, convection, and radiation can all take place in a thermal envelope. This is a brick cavity wall construction in a heating season. Heat flows by conduction through the solid materials, gypsum board, sheathing, rigid insulation, and face brick. Convection carries the heat flow in the two air cavities by air movement. Radiation occurs in the cavities from the warm surface to the cold surface. In this example, both concrete and rigid foam panels are one square feet in area and one inch in thickness. The temperature difference between the two sides is one degree F. Thermal resistance is defined as the amount of time in hours it takes for one BTU of heat to pass through these panels. In the case of the concrete panel, it takes 0.083 hours, whereas for the foam, it takes 4 hours. Therefore, the foam has a much higher R value than concrete. It is always desirable to have materials with higher R values in a thermal envelope. The R value of the same material with 4 inch thickness is 4 times the value in 1 inch. The thicker the material, the less heat it can transfer in a given time. The combined R value of two materials placed side by side is the sum of the R values of the materials. The U factor or U value is the overall heat transfer coefficient that describes how well a building assembly conducts heat. The lower the U factor is, the better the assembly is as a heat insulator. The U factor is the reciprocal of the overall R value of a thermal envelope. The overall R value of the assembly RT in this example is simply the sum of the R values of all the layers. Then the U factor can be calculated by taking the inverse of RT. Heat transfer rate through an assembly is then calculated by this formula. Q equals UA delta T. Q stands for hourly heat transfer rate in BTU per hour, and U is the U factor of the envelope in BTU per hour, degree, and square feet. Again, this is the inverse of the overall R value of the assembly. A is the area of the envelope component in question. The unit is square feet. Delta T is the indoor-outdoor air temperature difference in degree F. For example, what is the heat loss rate through the wall that is 8 feet high and 20 feet long if the indoor temperature is 75 degree F 
and the outer temperature is 20 degree F. The solution is by the UA delta T formula. We just calculated U, which is 0 0.069. 20 by 8 is the area of this wall. 75 minus 20 is the temperature difference. So the heat loss through this wall is about 600 BTU per hour. Here are a few notes about this formula. It applies to sensible heat transfer only, not to latent heat. The U factor is an overall coefficient of heat transfer, including O elements and O modes of sensible heat transfer, conduction, convection, and thermal radiation. It is only used where heat flow is from air to air, the part of the envelope typically above grade. Calculating the heat loss through a basement wall or slab on grid is more difficult because the soil can hold a large quantity of heat and unlike outdoor temperature that fluctuates, the temperature in the ground varies little by season. So the F factor is introduced for slab on grid expressed as heat loss per linear foot of slab perimeter. The equivalent U factor, UE, is developed to calculate heat flow through basement walls. We will not discuss these in details here. Condensation in a building enclosure assembly can lead to mold growth and other issues. Understanding the temperature distribution across the layers of a wall is critical in predicting condensation. This is a diagrammatic wall assembly with two layers of materials, both having a R value of 4. The temperature drop through a material is proportional to its R value. This means the total temperature drop of 30 degree F is proportionally allocated to each layer based on its R value. The total R value of the assembly is 8, so the drop of the temperature through each layer of R4 material is 15 degree F. Therefore, the temperature at surface B is 55 degree F. In the second case, the total R value of the assembly is 5, so the drop of the temperature through the R4 material is 24 degree F, which is four times that through the R1 material. Therefore, the temperature at surface B is 46 degree F. This shows how in a wall assembly, the material with the highest R value will cause the largest temperature drop. The temperature distribution across the layers of a wall assembly can be determined in the same way as in the last example. This table shows the calculation process. The largest temperature drop occurs in the rigid insulation layer between surface E and F because it has the highest R value. This example shows the wall in the winter, where the indoor air is warmer and more humid than outside, so the source of vapor that might condensate is from the interior. According to the psychometric chart, the dew point temperature of the indoor air at 70 degree F and 50% relative humidity is 50 degree F. To avoid condensation, the indoor air must be stopped from reaching a cold surface below 50 degree F. Therefore, the best place to install the vapor barrier, which is a membrane designed to stop vapor movement, is on surface E, the interior side of the insulation. If the indoor air reaches the other side of the insulation, surface F, at 33.58 degree F, condensation will occur. In the summer, however, the situation is the opposite. The best place to install the vapor barrier will be on surface F. So there is often no perfect location for the vapor barrier. It depends on the dominant climate condition of the site. The rule of thumb is to install the vapor barrier on the interior side of the insulation surface E in a colder climate and on the exterior side surface F in a hotter climate. The relationship between temperature distribution and R value 
can also explain why the window surface is colder than the wall surface in the interior in the winter. This is because windows typically have much lower R values than opaque walls. This wall section includes a window and an opaque wall in the winter. The wall assembly and the indoor-outdoor conditions are the same as in the last example, where the calculation shows that the surface temperature of the wall, the drywall surface, is at 68.12 degree F. This table shows the same process of calculation for the window. Because of the much lower window R value, the interior air film accounts for a larger portion in the overall R value of the window, resulting in a larger temperature drop from 70 degree F for the window than for the wall. Therefore, the surface temperature of the glass is 62.94 degree F, which is more than 5 degrees colder than the wall surface. So this means higher R values not only reduce heat transfer, but also raise the indoor surface temperatures in the winter and lower them in the summer both of which enhance thermal comfort. We have discussed the short wavelength solar radiation and long wavelength thermal radiation previously. Within solar radiation, there are ultraviolet, visible light, and solar infrared. Humans can only see the visible light spectrum between 740 and 380 nanometers. Thermal radiation refers to the radiant heat transfer between objects indoor and outdoor, such as human body, fireplace, radiators, etc. The radiation transmission of regular glass varies over different wavelength. In general, glass is more transparent to shortwave solar radiation than to longwave thermal radiation. This is the basis of the greenhouse effect. During daytime, the shortwave solar energy is mostly emitted into the greenhouse due to the glass high transmission to shortwave radiation. The solar heat warms up the items inside, and the energy turns into longwave thermal radiation. When thermal energy is radiating through the glass to outside, the glass walls only light through a portion of it. Therefore, heat is trapped inside the greenhouse, making it a heat-collecting space. For windows, the heat flow processes such as conduction, convection, and thermal radiation still apply, and are measured by the U-factor as for opaque components. Windows have another unique attribute. They emit solar radiation, which is measured by solar heat gain coefficient. Solar heat gain coefficient is a number between 0 and 1. 1 means 100% of the solar radiation incident on the window is through the window, whereas 0 means no solar radiation is emitted. The third parameter, visible transmittance, indicates how much visible light is transmitted through a window. Vt is a number between 0 and 1. 1 indicates the window emits 100% of the visible light whereas zero means none. As discussed previously, regular glass is more transparent to shortwave solar radiation than to longwave thermal radiation. A large portion of the thermal radiation is stopped by the glass from going through. Low-E glass has a thin transparent coating, the low-E coating, that reflects even more long-wave thermal radiation back to the inside. It is suitable for colder climates. Spectrally selective coatings are transparent to visible light but reflect both solar infrared and long-wave thermal radiation back to the outside. It is used in hotter climates to reduce heat gain while maintaining high visible light. Outdoor air is assumed to be fresh and clean. Indoor air gradually loses its oxygen and can also be contaminated. Residential buildings usually rely on infiltration to emit outside air. 
through cracks and gaps in the building envelope. Ashray provides a table to estimate the amount of infiltration based on season and construction type. It is measured by air exchanges per hour, the number of times the entire quantity of indoor air is replaced by outside air per hour. For example, if a building is built in between 1945 and 1972, its air change rate is 1.5 in the winter. It means that 1.5 times the entire quantity of indoor air is replaced by outside air per hour. In commercial buildings, fresh air intake is normally handled by mechanical ventilation. The outdoor air supply quantity is determined on the basis of the number of occupants or the square footage of the building. For example, the fresh air requirement is 15 CFM cubic feet per minute per person for most spaces with the exceptions listed in this table. Air changes per hour and cubic feet per minute both measure the rate of outside air. They can be converted to each other by this formula. To calculate sensible heat loads by infiltration or ventilation of outdoor air, use this formula. Now here is an example. A school building was built in 1954. The total square footage is 10,000 square feet with a 12 foot ceiling height. The total occupancy load of the school is 320 people. Determine the heat loss rate by airflow when outdoor temperature is minus 10 degree F and indoor temperature is at 70 degree F. Schools are commercial buildings, so fresh air is delivered by mechanical systems. And based on the ASHRAE guidelines, we should have 15 cubic feet per minute per person for the school. Because the school has 320 people, the total amount of fresh air intake is calculated by 15 times 320 and that's 4800 CFM. Mechanical ventilation and infiltration don't occur simultaneously because once the building is mechanically ventilated, the building will have a positive pressure inside and this will minimize infiltration. However, there might be times when the building's mechanical ventilation system stops working and during those times, the building will rely on infiltration for fresh air. And this is why infiltration is also calculated on the left here. The idea is to select the bigger number between ventilation and infiltration for heat loss calculation purpose. In this case, the ventilation rate is larger at 4,800 cubic feet per minute. Then we use this formula to calculate the heat loss rate due to fresh air intake. The purpose of calculating the heating and cooling design loss for the worst heating and cooling demands is to size the capacity of heating and cooling systems. Now let's use an example to demonstrate the process. This includes the information on the design indoor and outdoor conditions, information about the size and construction data of the building, such as R values of the walls, solar heat gain coefficient of the windows, etc. And lastly, the internal loads from within the conditioned spaces, such as the occupants, activity level, appliances, and equipment use, etc. This is the overall worksheet for the calculations. Before we zoom in, let's review some general information. The example shows the steps and calculations of the heating design load. The parameters for cooling design load are discussed, but the actual calculations, which are fairly complex and lengthy, are not in the scope of this discussion. Now let's zoom in to look at each section. The first step is to perform load calculations for above grade components and for sensible heat. And the method is by using the DOA delta T formula. For heating design loads, we start from the walls and then roof, windows, and then doors. For calculating cooling design loads in the summer, the way to quantify the delta T is different and more complex. Actually, it provides some methods for the purpose of that. 
Next, we look at the below grade components for sensible heat. Now, for heating design load, we use the F factor that we discussed before. And the formula is F times linear foot of the slab edge times delta T. The actual calculation is here. The heat gain from the edge of the slab is not considered for a cooling load design. The next is to look at the solar gain from windows. And this is not considered for heating design load because the winter design conditions occurs at night when solar radiation is not present. However, this will be considered for cooling design loads. The heat gain from solar radiation depends on glazing, glazing orientation and solar angles, etc. Now let's look at the sensible heat gain and loss from infiltration or ventilation. As we discussed before, infiltration and ventilation don't occur at the same time. But we still want to calculate them to select the bigger number. In this case, it is ventilation at 3600 CFM. Then we use this formula for the heat loss calculation. Sensible heat gain from infiltration or ventilation is also considered for cooling design loads. Dating heat from infiltration or ventilation is not considered for a heating design load because the air brought in as fresh air is typically dry in winter. However, it will be considered for cooling design loads for the moisture coming from internal sources, for example, from people or from outside air via infiltration or ventilation. Lastly, internal loads, including heat gain from people, electric lighting, equipment, etc. This is not considered for heating design load because the winter design condition occurs at night when internal loads are minimum. This will be considered for cooling design load. The heat gain is generally estimated from the wattage of the lights and equipment. At the end, the total winter heating design load is estimated as 274,377 BTU per hour. And this number will be used to size the heating equipment. The design loads calculations are often carried out by using computer programs. However, understanding the parameters and procedures is crucial to designers in assessing the impact of design decisions.